Welcome everyone, and this is lecture 22 in this series of lectures on fluid electrolyte and acid base disorders. This series accompany my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid Base Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You will find more information in the description below. It's available on Amazon as a paperback and also as an ebook. Today, we are still on Chapter 2, Hypokalemia, and this is Part 8, and we are doing case studies. Case number 3, Hyponatremia and Hypokalemia. Here we have a 71-year-old woman. She weighs 60 kilograms. She started on 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension. Initially, her lamps are fine. Two weeks later, she comes to the emergency department with weakness, and now she's hyponatremic, sodium-127. She's hypokalemic, potassium-2.7. So how would you manage? Now, here we have hyponatremia and hypokalemia due to hydrochlorothiazide. The point of this case is that we need to remember that both Sodium and potassium are effective osmols, so replacing potassium is exactly like replacing sodium. When we are replacing potassium, we should count that, otherwise we'll end up overcorrecting hyponatremia. So we are going to use this formula, and we talked about that when we discussed hyponatremia. Change in serum sodium equals infusate sodium, how much sodium we are infusing, how much sodium in the solution we're infusing, plus infusate potassium, how much potassium we're giving, minus current sodium divided by total body water plus one. Now she weighs 60 kilograms, total body water is approximately 30, and plus one is the liter we're given. So here, what we ended up doing, we gave her four doses of potassium chloride. Each dose is 100, mil 100 mil milliliters of 0.9 saline containing 20 equivalents of potassium chloride. So the total potassium chloride in the infusate is 20 times 4 is 80. Now we give her 0.9 saline at 75 ml an hour. So over 8 hours we have 600 ml. So we add those up. We add the sodium and the potassium. So how much sodium in the infusate is 154 equivalents and it's the same amount with the potassium chloride because we are infusing it in 0.9 saline and the 0.9 saline contains of course 154 mil equivalents of sodium per liter so 154 of sodium this is how much we gave a whole liter of saline plus the 80 of potassium minus 127 and the answer is 3.4 so Sodium will go up by 3.4 in 8 hours, which is good. So from 127 to about 130. So the point of this case is count potassium. When we are correcting hyponatremia, if we end up correcting hypokalemia, we have to add the potassium correction to the formula. Case number four, is this barter syndrome? Here we have a 20-year-old woman presenting with weakness and nausea, blood pressure 105 over 52, electrolytes, sodium is normal, potassium is low, 2.7, chloride 109, and bicarb is 21. An ion gap is 9. Urine electrolytes, sodium 50, potassium 11, chloride is 70, urine anion gap is negative 9. Now, the medical student on the case said, well, I think this is Barter syndrome. But the renal consultant said, no, no way, this is not Barter syndrome. This is not even type 1 distal tubular acidosis. Why? Who is correct? Is it the nephrologist? What do they know, right? Let's discuss this case. So what do we have here? We have severe symptomatic hypokalemia, potassium 2.7, plus probable metabolic acidosis, Serum CO2 is low. We didn't do a blood gas, but let's assume that this is what we have. We have a normal serum anion gap and a negative urine anion gap. This goes with diarrhea or laxative abuse because you have hypokalemia with normal anion gap, metabolic acidosis, and a negative urine anion gap. Now, I will talk about that in much more details when we discuss metabolic acidosis in future lectures. On the other hand, Barter syndrome, here we have normal blood pressure and renal wasting of potassium. Well, here we don't have renal wasting of potassium, 
the urine potassium was only 9, consistent with GI loss, like diarrhea. Now, with Barter syndrome, also we have alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis, not acidosis. Like I said before, Barter syndrome is like taking a loop diuretic, renal wasting of potassium, and metabolic alkalosis. So this picture does not fit Barter at all. Type 1 distal RTA, also you have renal wasting of potassium, and a positive urine anion gap. Here we have neither. Urine potassium is low, and we have a negative urine anion gap. Now, finally, vomiting, diarrhea, laxative abuse, bulimia, abuse of diuretic, use of diuretics are far more common causes of hyperkalemia than Barter, Gittleman, Little syndrome, renal tubular acidosis. So you have to consider those first. Case number five, hypokalemia in a patient with acute myelogenous leukemia, AML. 40-year-old man with a known diagnosis of AML was found to have a potassium that is really low, 1.9, on a routine lab. His leukocyte count is 290,000. How would you replace? Now, let's look at some clues. The patient is asymptomatic despite severe hypokalemia, so maybe there's something wrong. This is a case of pseudo-hypokalemia due to AML. We talked about that. The uh, blood sample was drawn. It sat in the lab. And then you have uptake of potassium by white blood cells. So all we did, we repeated the sample, and uh, the sample was immediately analyzed, and we got a potassium of 3.7. So no action is required. Case number six, hypokalemia and hypertension. 26-year-old man, a uh, young man with blood pressure 161 over 101, initial electrolytes, sodium 144, potassium a little bit low, 3.5 or on the low side, chloride 109, bicarb 29, slightly elevated. The patient was started on chlorothalidone 25 milligrams daily for hypertension. A week later, his sodium is still okay. It dropped a little bit, but potassium is profoundly low now. 2.2, chloride 101, and here you have a bicarb of 32, it went up. How would you manage his hypokalemia? Well, here we need to do a workup for secondary hypertension. This is a young man, 26-year-old with severe hypertension. So when you have severe hypokalemia to begin with, or even borderline, that got a lot worse with a thiazide diuretic, this is a clue that you may have primary aldosteronism. So then, okay, you replace potassium, of course, you stop the chlorothiazide, like the hydrochlorothiazide or the, chlor the chlorothalidone, but you need to do a workup. So you follow the guidelines by the Endocrine Society for Primary Aldosteronism. Briefly, you do a screening test, like uh, plasma uh, renin activity and plasma aldosterone in the morning if the ratio of plasma aldosterone to plasma renin activity is elevated you do a second test that second test is either repeating the PRA and PA after suppression with two liters of saline over four hours or you do 24-hour urine aldosterone after salt loading if you still have elevated aldosterone then you do a CT scan with contrast for the adrenal gland. Now, if you have a mass, you consider doing adrenal vein sampling, and then you consider surgery, which is usually curative in a patient like this. Case number seven, hypokalemia in a clay eater. Wow. 19-year-old woman was brought to the ED by her family due to nausea, proximal muscle weakness, and fatigue. Her family is concerned because she's been eating a large amount of clay powder she bought on the internet. She's using it for detoxification. Sodium, 135. Potassium, profoundly low, 2.1. Chloride, 105. Bicarb, 23. CK was elevated at 1,200. Urine electrolytes, sodium, 85. Potassium, notice, is on the low side, 18. And chloride, 60. How would you manage this hypokalemia? Her hypokalemia is due to ingestion of clay, of bentonite clay. It binds potassium in the GI tract. It's like a potassium binder. Now, her low urine potassium is a clue that this is non-arena loss of potassium. This is GI loss. 
And this uh, bentonite clay powder is advertised as a detox agent, as a cleanser, that it is useful for constipation, nausea, uh, can be used as a face mask for oily skin. And so we have to be careful uh, with things like that. So this patient required both oral and intravenous replacement of potassium, and she was instructed to avoid bentonite. Uh, in the literature, there's a report of a three-year-old girl who presented with a potassium of 0.9, profound hypokalemia, due to oral and rectal use of bentonite for constipation. And she improved with saline hydration and multiple doses of intravenous potassium chloride. I'm going to stop here, and uh, next lecture we'll do more cases. Thank you.